Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low-priced commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Goblin Dragon fanatic Goro Goro, Disciple of Ryusei. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what builds we'll be covering in the following weeks. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Guru Guru is a 2-2 goblin samurai that costs 1 in a red with the following abilities. Pay a red, all creatures you control gain haste until the end of the turn. Pay 3 and double red, create a 5-5 dragon spirit creature token with flying. Activate only if you control an attacking modified creature. Breaking down his core stats, Guru Guru is sporting a low to the ground CMC, a pretty standard stat block for the cost, and a pair of abilities that allow our creatures to get into combat faster while enabling us to create big evasive bodies if those creatures are modified. Looking at his first ability, it's a pretty straightforward haste enabler, allowing us to cheaply get all our creatures into combat as soon as we summon them. Sadly, this doesn't synergize very well with his second ability as the tokens he creates will be summoned after attacks are declared, but it does help all our other creatures, especially bigger ones in the later game, to get in for damage faster, and it can still be used by the tokens he creates if we're able to get additional combat steps on the turns that they're summoned, which our color has very easy access to. His second ability, however, is why we're here, as it enables us to get big evasive bodies on the field turn after turn. There are a few hoops that need to be jumped through, as we do need to have an attacking modified creature and 5 mana open to do this. But once the first token is created, we should have no issue modifying it and continue to swing in with it to allow our commander to produce even more tokens off the back of it on the following turns. And it should be noted that this ability isn't limited to once per turn, so if we happen to have an absurd amount of mana open in the later game, we can activate this multiple times to get even more big evasive bodies on the field to crack in with. So Based on his abilities, we can see that Goro Goro wants us to swing in with modified creatures ASAP so he can begin creating big evasive dragons as they do so. Which is why this build will be an equipment focused one that aims to get our dragon production online as soon as possible, modifying them, then using them to enable our commander to create even more. Of course, that means we'll need to have lots of means to modify our creatures, ranging from low cost equipment to quickly make our creatures modified before our commander comes in, or instead using creatures and effects that can modify themselves or others with counters to achieve the same effect. We'll also be running plenty of reconfigure creatures and living weapon equipment to help with these modifications, since they both serve as bodies we can modify early and later turn into mods themselves that we can use to suit up our dragons. Speaking of dragons, while our commander's quite apt at creating them, he won't be the only source of them in this build, as we'll be running a number of other ways to get additional dragon tokens on the field to grow our dragon flight, as well as a handful of payoffs to take advantage of them further as the game progresses. So let's see if we can get Goro Goro to take a break from his incessant simping over Atsushi to actually lead our warband. I mean honestly, he's given her nearly a mountain of offerings and still hasn't received even the slightest acknowledgement from the spirit dragon, unless of course you count not being eaten by her as he keeps insisting on calling her her old name. Or maybe Atsushi likes this goblin more than she lets on, since she did insist we bring him back in one piece when we dragged him away kicking and screaming to lead our army, though she was quick to point out that it wasn't because she liked him or anything. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have a pair of reconfigured creatures joining our arsenal with Rabbit Battery and Simeon Sling. Rabbit Battery is a 1-1 with haste and reconfigure for a red that gives the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1 in haste, providing us with a very cheap body to drop early and modify to enable our commander's token creation, which we can later use to cheaply modify our dragons to enable them to continue proccing our commander instead. Simeon Sling is another 1-1, this time with reconfigure 2, that grants the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1 and deals 1 damage to the defending player if it or the equipped creature becomes blocked, again giving us a low mana body to drop early that we can use to modify our other creatures with a slight stat boost and additional burn if they get blocked. Then we close out this slot with Dragon Master Outcast, a 1-1 that, on our upkeep, creates a 5-5 flying dragon token if we control 6 plus lands, making it an easy to achieve mana-less way to bolster our draconic forces turn after turn by simply existing. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, the first half brings us another pair of equipment creatures with Lizard Blades and Ogre Head Helm. Lizard Blades is a 1-1 with Double Strike and reconfigure for 2 that grants the equipped creature Double Strike, easily allowing an evasive dragon token to deal a massive 10 damage per swing minimum to really put the pressure on our opponent's life totals. Ogre Head Helm is a 2-2 with reconfigure for 3, grants the equipped creature plus 2 plus 2, and if it or the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, lets us sack it, discard our hand, and draw 3 cards, providing our creatures with a serviceable stat boost when equipped alongside the means to turn them into card draw if needed. The latter half of this slot then closes out with Runaway Steamkin and Dragonkin Berserker. 
Runaway Steamkin is a 1-1 that gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter whenever we cast a red spell, limited to 3, and lets us remove 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it to produce 3 red mana, easily allowing it to modify itself as we cast our red spells, enabling it to swing in as a modified 4-4, then allowing us to use the counters on it to generate more mana to summon more dragons, speeding up our deck considerably. Dragonkin Berserker is a 2-2 with first strike that reduces the cost of all boast abilities by 1 for each dragon we control, and has boast for 4 and a red to create a 5-5 flying dragon token, eventually being able to create evasive 5-5s for a single red mana, and his built-in first strike allowing him to more easily survive combat after being modified to trigger his boast. Now entering the CMC3 slot, we start off with a trio of modifying creatures with Tauren Mauler, Krinko 10 Street Kingpin, and Togo Goblin Weaponsmith. Tauren Mauler is a 2-2 with Changeling that gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter whenever an opponent casts a spell, almost guaranteeing that we have a modified creature to enable our commander on the following turn that we cast it, and quickly becoming a massive threat that we can further modify to make even deadlier. Krenko is a 1-2 that, whenever he attacks, gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter and then creates 1-1 one, one goblin tokens equal to his power, again giving us an easily modified body to get our commander's ability online and, if we modify him further, enables him to flood the board with an army of goblins as well. Tago is a 2-2 that, whenever a land ETB is under our control, creates a rock, which is an equipment that equips for 1 and lets us pay 1 and tap the equipped creature to have it deal 2 damage to any target, enabling us to continually get very cheap equipment into play to modify a large number of our creatures, and later using them to deal with creatures, planeswalkers, or just throwing them at our opponent's faces for additional damage. Then we close out this slot with Burnished Heart, a 2-2 that we can pay 3 and sack to put 2 basic lands from our deck into play tapped, serving as a reliable way to speed up our mana curve to get us to the 5 mana we need to begin creating dragons with our commander. Proceeding to the CMC4 slot, we start off with a pair of ram-focused entrants in the form of Leyline Tyrant and Solemn Simulacrum. Leyline Tyrant is a 4-4 flyer that prevents us from losing red mana in our mana pool as steps and phases end, and, when it dies, lets us spend any amount of red mana to deal that much damage to any target, allowing us to stockpile our mana so it doesn't go to waste if left unused, and, should our opponents remove it before we can pump that mana into our commander, at least allows us to convert it into damage to deal with something on their board or to reduce their life totals as a consolation prize. Psalm Simulacrum is a 2-2 that, when it ETBs, has to search our deck for a basic land and put it into play tapped, and, when it dies, draws us a card, again serving as an acceptable ramp source to help speed up our mana base, as well as an expendable creature we can modify to enable our commander that even cantrips when it dies. Thundering Raiju then closes out this slot, a 3-3 with haste that, when it attacks, puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control and then deals X damage to each opponent, where X is equal to the number of modified creatures we control apart from itself, giving us a repeatable way to both modify itself and others, and then serving as a payoff for those modified creatures by adding in some additional burn. Continuing on to the CMC5 slot, we have its trio of members with Kami of Celebration, Scourge of Balkus, and Elena Kessig Trapper. Kami of Celebration is a 3-3 that, whenever a modified creature we control attacks, exiles a top card of our deck, letting us play that card until the end of the turn, and lets us put a plus one plus one counter on target creature whenever we cast spells from exile, serving as a manaless source of card advantage as we swing in with our modified creatures that modifies even more creatures as we cast those spells. Scourge of Alcus is a 4-4 flyer that we can pay a red to give plus one plus zero until end of turn, and whenever it or another dragon ETB is under our control, it deals X damage to any target, where X is equal to the number of dragons we control, making it a solid payoff for our dragon token production as we create more to get even more damage in as we do so, while also possessing a solid evasive body to get in for damage itself. Elena is a 4-3 with first strike that we can tap to generate red mana equal to the greatest power among creatures we control that ETB'd that turn, enabling us to activate our commander twice each turn by generating 5 red mana as the first dragon comes into play for our commander to immediately use again, doubling his dragon production so long as she sticks around. Nearing the end now, the CMC 6 slot brings us its single entry with Aki Battle Squad, a 6-6 six -six that, once each turn when one or more modified creatures we control attack, untaps all modified creatures we control and gives us an additional combat phase after the attack, easily allowing our modded dragons to swing in twice per round, making it a potent finisher to double up our damage output in the late game. Finally, reaching the CMC7 slot in our last creature entrant, we have Skyline Despot, a 5-5 flyer that makes us the monarch when it ETBs, and on our upkeep if we're the monarch, creates a 5-5 flying dragon token, giving us an easily defendable source of card advantage thanks to our dragon production and increasing that production further the longer we hold onto the crown, while also serving as a solid evasive threat in its own right. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. 
Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we start off with some flexible removal spells in the form of a braid and you find some prisoners, both of which allow us to destroy target artifact, the former alternatively allowing us to deal 3 damage to a creature, while the latter instead lets us exile the top 3 cards of target opponent's deck, letting us choose one to play until the end of the turn and letting us spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast it, both providing us with means to deal with troublesome artifacts while giving us the option to hit creatures or use it as card advantage instead depending on what the situation calls for. Tybalt's Trickery then closes out this slot, which counters target spell, then has its controller mill 1-3 to three cards randomly before they start exiling cards off the top of their deck, having them continue until they reveal a non-land card with a different name than the countered spell and allowing them to cast it for free, sending all other cards revealed this way to the bottom of their deck in a random order, making it one of the few ways we can protect our board against wipes in our color that, while a bit random, is still better than getting our hard-earned board blown out by a well-timed wipe. Moving on to the CMC3 slot, we have its single entrant with Chaos Warp, which shuffles target permanents back into its owner's deck, then has the owner reveal a top card of their deck, letting them put it into play for free if it's a permanent, providing our build with a flexible removal option that's capable of dealing with a wide variety of permanent-based threats, which makes it well worth running despite its randomness. Finally, reaching the CMC4 slot, we have our last instant with Bolt Bend, which costs 3 less if we control a creature with 4 plus power and lets us change the target of target spell or ability that only has a single target, giving us a way to protect our commander or other key pieces from targeted removal while redirecting it to another threat in the process, often for only a single mana. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have its only entry with Vandal Blast, which destroys target artifact we don't control and has Overload for 4 and a red, which will usually be overloading to destroy all our opponent's artifacts while leaving ours untouched. Continuing on to the CMC2 slot, we have its trio of members with Mizium Mortars, Explosive Entry, and Reckless Impulse. Mizium Mortars lets us deal 4 damage to target creature we don't control and has Overload for 3 and triple red, making it either a single target removal spell or a one-sided board wipe that deals with mid-sized creatures, which is a nice amount of flexibility to have. Explosive Entry destroys up to 1 target artifact and puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on up to 1 target creature, still being worth running despite its slow speed by both destroying a common threat type while modifying our creature simultaneously on the cheap. Reckless Impulse has us exile the top two cards of our deck and lets us play those cards until the end of our next turn, making it a simple and cheap source of card advantage that can go a long way to ensure we make our land drops or hit cheap equipment to enable our commander in the early game. Finally, reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our last two sorceries with Spit Flame and Light Up the Stage. Spit Flame deals 4 damage to target creature and lets us pay a red to return it from our grave back to our hand when a dragon ETB is under our control, providing us with a repeatable source of creature removal we can easily get back as our commander summons more and more dragons onto the battlefield. Light Up the Stage has Spectacle for a red and lets us exile the top two cards of our deck, letting us play those cards until the end of our next turn, making it another cheap draw spell for us to take advantage of that gets even cheaper as our evasive dragons crack in for damage. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. It's single entries all the way down in this category, starting off in the CMC2 slot with its single entrant, Dragon Tempest, which gives any flying creature that ETBs under our control haste until the end of the turn, and, whenever a dragon ETBs under our control, deals X damage to any target where X is the number of dragons we control, making it the enchantment version of Scourge of Valkus, which, while it doesn't have a body to swing in with, hits the board much earlier and is harder to deal with from the back row, which is a fine trade-off. At the halfway mark now, the CMC3 slot brings us Furious Rise, which, on our end step, if we control a creature with 4 plus power, exiles the top card of our deck and lets us play it until we exile another card with Furious Rise, giving us some free continual impulse draw thanks to our Dragon Token production for us to take advantage of. Finally, the CMC4 slot brings us our last enchantment with Outpost Siege, which lets us pick cons or dragons as a DTBs. If cons is chosen, we get to exile the top card of our deck on our upkeep and play it until the end of the turn, while if dragons is chosen, we deal 1 damage to any target whenever a creature we control leaves the battlefield, which will almost always be running for its cons effect in order to get us more free draw each turn to allow us to dig deeper into our deck for more resources. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we begin with some low-cost equipment in the form of Explorer's Scope and Infiltration Lens, both of which equip for one, the former letting us look at the top card of our deck when the equipped creature attacks and letting us put that card into play tapped if it's a land, while the latter lets us draw two if the equipped creature is blocked, making them both incredibly cheap means to modify our creatures while occasionally generating us additional ramp or card advantage respectively. 
Basilisk Collar, Zephyr Boots, and Prying Blade then join us as additional equipment entrants, all of which equip for two, the first granting the equipped creature Death Touch and Life Link, the second granting the equipped creature Flying and letting us draw a card then discard a card when it deals combat damage, and the last granting the equipped creature plus one plus zero and creating a treasure token whenever it deals combat damage to a player, all of which being a bit slower to equip and modify our creatures than the previous entrants, but still providing solid keywords and effects for our creatures to take advantage of on the cheap. Flare Husk then joins us as our last piece of equipment in this slot, which we can equip for two, gives the equipped creature plus one plus one, and has Living Weapon, effectively making it a creature that comes into play modified thanks to the germ token it comes equipped to, which helps enable our commander in the early game, and then we can later use to modify our dragons once the initial body is dealt with. Finally, we close out this slot with Soul Ring, which we can tap for two colorless, which of course we're running because it's the best mana rock in our format, the mana boost it provides speeding up our game plan considerably, especially if drawn early. Then more mana rocks join us as we move on to the CMC2 slot, starting off with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Fire Diamond, which comes into play tapped and taps for a red, Star Compass, which comes into play tapped and taps for any mana a basic land we control would be able to produce, Liquid Metal Torque, which taps for a colorless and we can tap it to make target non land permanent an artifact until the end of the turn, and Mind Stone, which taps for a colorless and we can pay one, tap it and sack it to draw a card, all of which help us get to the five mana we need as quickly as possible to begin our dragon token creation, while some can provide us with additional utility as a bonus. Moving back to equipment now, we start off with some defensive armaments in the form of Mask of Avacyn, Mirror Shield, and Swiftfoot Boots, all of which grant the equipped creature Hexproof, the first equipping for three and also granting the equipped creature plus one plus two, the second equipping for two, granting the equipped creature plus zero plus two and having it destroy any creature with death touch that it would block or would block it, and the last equipping for one and also granting the equipped creature Haste, making them all valuable means to screen our commander against targeted removal as we'll need to keep him alive for as long as possible to continue fueling our dragon token production. Then moving deeper into our equipment arsenal, we have some ramp options joining us with Dowsing Dagger and Goldbane Pick. Dowsing Dagger has target opponent create two 0 2 plant tokens when it ETBs, equips for two, grants the equipped creature plus two plus one, and, when it deals combat damage to a player, transforms into Lost Veil, vale, a land that taps for three mana of any one color. Ramping us by a massive three if we can get an easy attack in early with one of our smaller creatures to help us grow our mana base significantly. Goldvein Pick equips for one, grants the equipped creature plus one plus one, and creates a treasure token whenever it deals combat damage to a player. Like Prying Blade before it, giving us another source of ramp that we can use to modify our creatures to enable our commander and other payoffs. A pair of card advantage generating pieces of equipment then join us next with Mask of Memory and Rogue's Gloves, both of which let us draw cards when the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, the former equipping for one and letting us draw two and discard one, while the latter equips for two and draws one instead, again providing us with cheap sources of modification that will generate us a steady stream of card advantage as we use them to modify our evasive dragon tokens. Then we close out this slot with three more pieces of equipment, those being Batterbone, Illusionist's Bracers, and Ring of Valkus. Batterbone equips for 5, grants the equipped creature plus 1 plus 1, Vigilance and Lifelink, as well as having a living weapon, giving us another body that comes into play modified, and later giving our evasive dragon tokens a potent pair of keywords to take advantage of. Illusionist Bracers equips for 3 and copies any non-mana abilities of the equipped creature whenever we activate them, doubling up our commander's token creation for free every time we activate it to really speed up our game plan. Ring of Valkus equips for 1, grants the equipped creature haste, and on our upkeep also gives that creature a plus 1 plus 1 counter if it's red, making it an easy means to permanently modify our creatures over time as we pass it from creature to creature each turn. Entering the CMC3 slot and our last slot for artifacts, we start off with Dragon's Horde, which taps for any color and, whenever a dragon ETBs under our control, gets a gold counter, which alternatively lets us tap it and remove a gold counter from it to draw a card, making it a serviceable mana rock and later becoming a source of repeatable draw for us as we create more and more dragon tokens. Returning to equipment as we move deeper into this slot, we have Nettle Cyst and Bearded Axe, both of which equip for two, the former granting the equipped creature plus one plus one for each artifact and or enchantment we control as well as having a living weapon, while the latter instead grants plus one plus one for each dwarf equipment and or vehicle we control, making them both excellent payoffs for our equipment heavy build to allow our evasive tokens to hit even harder. Loxodon Warhammer and Stratoscythe then get added to our equipment arsenal as well, both of which equip for three, the former granting the equipped creature plus three plus zero trample and lifelink, while the latter exiles a land from our deck when it ETBs and grants the equipped creature plus one plus one for each land on the battlefield with the same name, allowing us to either crash through blockers and gain huge swaths of life back, or instead crack in for enormous amounts of damage that scales with the amount of mountains in play, either of which are good for us. Whisper Silk Cloak then gets added in as a more defensive option, an equipment that equips for two makes the equipped creature 
unblockable and grants it Shroud, giving us another way to protect our commander from targeted removal while also ensuring he can safely attack in to proc his own ability. Finally, we close out our artifacts with Battle Mage's Bracers and Rings of Bright Hearth, both of which allow us to copy activated abilities so long as they're not mana abilities, the former being an equipment that equips for one, grants the equipped creature haste, and lets us pay one to copy the equipped creature's ability as we use it, while the latter can copy any activated ability as we use it if we pay two providing our build with even more ways to double up on our commander's ability, and possibly more than double if we have multiple copy sources in play simultaneously. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our only Planeswalker joins us in the CMC 5 slot, that being Sarkon the Masterless, who comes into play with 5 loyalty and has the following abilities. His passive, whenever any creature attacks us or a Planeswalker we control, has each dragon we control deal 1 damage to that creature, his plus 1 turns each Planeswalker we control into a 4-4 flying dragon until end of turn, and his minus 3 creates a 4-4 flying dragon token, his passive alone making it nearly impossible for our opponents to attack us once we have enough dragons in play, while his token creation and ability to transform himself into a dragon generate us more board presence to pressure the board even further. That covers our Planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Our only mana land this time around is Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless, and we can pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped, serving as a decent source of ramp from the land slot to help quicken up our mana base. Then for utility lands, we start off with Ghost Quarter, Scavenger Grounds, and Bonders Enclave. Ghost Quarter taps for a colorless, and we can tap it and sack it to destroy target land, letting its owner replace it with a basic from their deck, providing us with a relatively easy way to deal with any problematic utility lands we may encounter. Scavenger Grounds also taps for a colorless and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to exile all cards from all graveyards, providing our build with some solid graveyard hate from the land slot to help us fight against any graveyard-focused builds we may encounter. Bonders Enclave taps for a colorless as well and lets us pay three and tap it to draw a card, but only if we control a creature with power four or greater, giving us a continual source of card advantage from the land slot in the mid to late game once we start creating our dragon tokens. Then we close out our utility lands with Tyrite Sanctum, which we can tap for a colorless or instead either pay 2 and tap it to give target legendary creature the god subtype and a plus 1 plus 1 counter, or pay 4, tap it and sack it to give target god an indestructible counter, over time making our commander very difficult to interact with so we can freely create dragon tokens with impunity. Finally, we're running 31 mountains as our basics to close out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 20 creatures including the Commander, 6 instants, 5 sorceries, 3 enchantments, 29 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 34 cards that can modify themselves or others, 5 cards that care about creatures being modified, 5 cards that can create evasive dragon tokens, 5 cards that care about dragons, 7 cards that protect creatures from targeting or destruction, and 3 cards that allow us to copy abilities. Leaving us with a veritable arsenal to mod up our creatures, means of creating additional dragon tokens alongside our commander, payoffs for both to get even more value out of them, as well as ways to keep our commander protected and get additional uses out of his ability at a reduced cost. For general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 12 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp being a bit higher than normal to more easily get us to the 5 mana we need to activate our commander's ability, but our other stats falling within typical ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 11 1 drops, 26 2 drops, 16 3 drops, 5 4 drops, 4 5 drops, 1 6 drop, and 1 7 drop giving us a very aggressive curve that aims to ramp as hard as possible early while dropping cheap creatures and cards to modify them to activate our commander as soon as possible, enabling him to flood the board with big evasive dragons turn after turn as we make them deadlier with our modifications. Currently, this deck is valued at $65.28, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, additional equipment such as Black Blade Reforged, Cliffhaven Kite Sail, and Hero's Blade are worth considering for their free or reduced cost to equip, while Kamenu Battle Armor and Bronze Plate Boar make good reconfigure options if we want more bodies that we can later use to modify our creatures. For upgrades, Sword of the Animist and Sword of Hearth and Home are both great sources of modification that also provide us with continual land-based ramp. Lightning Greaves, Commander's Plate, and Champion's Helm all provide our commander with even more protection to keep him alive for longer, and Terror of the Peaks and Udvara Hellkite each provide us with additional value in the form of damage or bodies as we get more of our dragon tokens into play. And finally, if we want to kick our arsenal into high gear, they don't come better than Sword of Truth and Justice, Sword of Fire and Ice, and Sword of Peace and Famine, all of which provide our creatures with excellent color protection, stat increases, and abilities at a relatively low cost, at least mana-wise, since our wallets sadly have no protection against their price. 
Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I'd like to thank subscribers new and old for helping the channel crack the 3.5k milestone. Thank you all for your continued support, as this channel wouldn't have gotten to this point without it. Taking a look at last week's poll, it looks like Grease Fang was able to claim the first place spot this time around, so look forward to a vehicle reanimation deck featuring her next week. Moving on to this week's poll, we'll actually be postponing that for the time being. As with the new commander decks from Streets of New Capenna being right around the corner, we'll be working on getting those pre-con upgrades out as soon as possible. But that doesn't mean I still don't want to hear from you. Please let me know in the comments below what new commanders from New Capenna you're most excited about and want to see in future polls, so we can start building them as soon as the commander decks are covered. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Invaser for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Invaser, and thanks for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.